that was a very nice talk, and uh, in some ways it's, it's, it's good when you have, e even though it's a slight advantage in terms of what the audience uh, believed beforehand, it seems like that would be favorable, but it means that uh, there's more room for me to go down uh, in terms of, uh, of, of what the, the end result is. So uh, in terms of my position, my position is that really any EGFR TKI is appropriate right now. The one thing that I certainly think both of us would concede is that in the end, this is a dangerous argument to be making either way because you're going to have an actual answer um, based on the study that, that, that Jack showed, that you will have a comparison versus Jafitnib and that data will read out. But uh, short of that, we can go through what the data is and, and I'll summarize some of it, but of course, it's already been presented in terms of what the studies are. So of course, there is agreement that an EGFR inhibitor is the optimal initial therapy for most EGFR mutant small, uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients. And um, this is not projecting particularly well. Um, it's a little too small, but, but basically look at the, um, just the, the arrow at the bottom, which is showing the progression-free survival across studies. Um, this is from a meta-analysis in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And what you will see, this is again progression-free survival, not overall survival, which is uh, what's largely being argued here. But you can see that clearly if you compare across studies an EGFR TKI to chemotherapy, that uh, for progression-free survival, an EGFR TKI clearly wins. Now, in the US, a lot of us have used the data from your TAC as being sort of the most appropriate data set for us. Um, there clearly are differences that are seen with EGFR inhibitors in Asian populations versus, uh, versus Caucasian populations. And so again, a busy slide um, showing the schema of your TAC, but basically it was a study that was comparing standard chemotherapy to erlotinib. And what you can see is that in terms of progression-free survival here, you have a very impressive hazard ratio of um, 0.37. Uh, in favor of erlotinib. The median progression-free survival uh, was 9.7 months, uh, whereas the one-year PFS was 40%. But this is versus chemotherapy, which was a median uh, PFS of 5.2 months, and, uh, and then one year was only 10%. Now, one thing, and, and I don't have the right slides for this, but just to sort of counter one of the arguments. So, if you look here, the median progression-free survival duration difference is about four months, uh, four and a half months. That's not that far off from what you've seen in the Lux lung studies um, overall in terms of progression-free survival. Now, some of that may be larger when one looks at exon 19 versus other, but one thing I would say is I am always suspicious when you have an overall survival benefit that exceeds the progression-free survival benefit. Um, the question always is, why did that happen? Um, are there some sort of long-lasting effects of the drug that make it so that people do well even after they're off? This has been argued very commonly in the immunotherapies, but I would argue that it's not just the immunotherapies where people have argued this. People have been saying this for years, and I can't tell you how many meetings I've been at where people have said, well, we think that there is a disease-modulating effect and my answer has always been, why? Um, and now the immunotherapies, at least I would argue, you can make a theoretical argument, although I will also state that the data there is still very unclear as to whether you are in fact doing that. But it is something that at least makes me suspicious when you look at the kind of median progression-free survival durations that you are getting. So the waterfall plot, of course, um, clearly favors the EGFR inhibitor. So, the benefit across studies with respect to progression-free survival um, have shown greater incremental benefit when you look at the exon 19 compared to exon 21. So clearly, uh, when one looks, so this is your TAC, and you can see um, clearly there is a difference between the progression-free survival um, in the exon 19, which greatly favors the, uh, the erlotinib, versus the, uh, the point mutation in exon 21 where there certainly is an impressive trend, but there do appear to be fairly clear differences. Um, and this is the original figure that I showed you, again, looking at progression-free survival. And this, again, is from a meta-analysis in, um, you know, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. 
And although the trend in both, uh, here you can see the one that is circled is the Exxon 19 deletion. Um, on the other side, you have the, the L858R um, mutation. And what you can see is that clearly there are differences here. Although both of them appear to be favored versus chemotherapy, um, the Exxon 19 deletion is more profound. And um, the, so, so now, whereas other, and this should be EGFR inhibitors, EGFR inhibitors have never shown a survival advantage, as Jack mentioned, a fatinib is associated with superior survival in exon 19 deletion. And he's already gone through this data um, showing that um, when you combine, at least in the exon 19 and, uh, and L858R mutation patients, there is some advantage. Now, this is um, breaking down Lux Lung 3 and Lux Lung 6 specifically looking at um, the afatinib versus chemotherapy. Again, the chemotherapy regimens are different between the two. Uh, but what you can see is that the, here the overall survival did not significantly differ by group. However, when you look based on the, um, the deletion, there was a clear advantage. And, and we've already gone through the, the impressive duration of advantage. Um, interestingly, the hazard ratio um, for the group was 1.25 and almost approached harm. Um, it did not hit that, it, but, but the, the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval was a hazard ratio of 0.92 um, versus the upper limit being 1.71. Uh, so, so here you can look at these two studies. Um, no, this is, I'm sorry, Lux Lung 3. This again is versus PEM cis. Uh, you can see that these are just the components, this slide and the next slide that make up the, the, the slide that I showed before. And you can see in both of them, uh, interestingly, at least looking at the graphs, the L858R, it seemed that if anything, the chemotherapy did a little bit better, um, which of course is not the case for the Exxon 19, where you do see very strong differences in both. So does this data make a fat nib better? And in, in fact, to me, this is actually the strongest argument rather than a scientific argument. And this is for any of you uh, who are football fans, is does this make a fat nib better? So I'm showing you the results from two sequential weeks. They're 10 days apart because I think one of them had like the Thursday night game and one of them had them, and then it was the Monday night game the next week. Um, so the New York Jets, not a great football team, but a football team. Um, it, you know, they do... <laughs> They, they're used as a football team, they have a fan base, all those sorts of things. So, so sort of like standard chemotherapy. And on October 16th, um, in 2014, they played uh, the well-documented group of cheaters from Boston area. And when that happened, they did win. It was a marginal win, right? They won by two points. Then the very next week, the same, New England, the same New York Jets played the Buffalo Bills, and the Buffalo Bills killed them. It was uh, 43 to 23. Um, I think it was a Monday night game. It probably wasn't particularly entertaining. Um, and despite, but the, the point of this, of course, is that despite Buffalo looking much better versus a common opponent on subsequent weeks, Buffalo failed to make the playoffs while the Patriots won the Super Bowl. And you'll note the asterisk, and there is no footnote there. Um, so, so, so. But that's what I'm, what I'm trying to indicate here is that just because one beat by a small amount and one beat by a large amount doesn't make one, one necessarily better when, and, and that appears to be the case here. So the other thing I think that's important to address in this, in this is whether a single agent inhibitor of EGFR is truly the optimal therapy. And I'm not going to address the, um, the role of the third generation EGFR inhibitors um, Many people in the room are, you know, have been involved in the development of that. Uh, Jonathan Goldman, who you hear from lately, led up these efforts at, at, you know, at UCLA. And the, the thing that I will address, though, is the study of erlotinib plus bevacizumab. And the reason I'll address this and not the, the third generation is that we don't actually have frontline data available in a significant set, setting in that, um, in, excuse me, in the third generation EGFR inhibitors. But we do for the combination of erlotinib and bevacizumab. So this was a Japanese study, um, small study, 154 patients, where they randomized patients to uh, 
to uh, the EGFR inhibitor ver versus EGFR inhibitor and angiogenesis inhibitor. And when you did that, you can see that these are also quite profound differences. This, again, is progression-free survival. And progression-free survival was significantly prolonged when bevacizumab was added to erlotinib. Again, the effects were more prominent in exon 19 deletion. Um, this was particularly profound, 18 months versus 10.3 months. But again, less than what we see in that, you know, what, however you view the progression-free versus overall survival difference, um, and not as profound as the difference in the exon 19 patients um, you know, that was seen with a fat nib versus chemo. So if you look again, this is just showing the, the same thing with, uh, you, you know, the main thing to look at here is exon 19 versus, um, versus L858R, again, showing very similar trends. Uh, these are the waterfall plots uh, in favor, clearly, of the bevacizumab combination. Now here, the, um, you'll note that the overall survival data was quite immature, and so we can't really make any conclusions. Um, although, to get a little bit at some of the data that was presented um, you know, from patients in Japan and things, uh, this, which was a Japanese study, these patients, as you can see, are all doing quite well in terms of overall survival. Um, although this is admittedly immature data at this point. So the question is, should that be our standard? But I think that what one has to look at there is whether or not there are examples of data in Japan not really being replicated very well here. And, the, and of course, the answer is that there, that there is. So this is data looking at uh, small cell lung cancer, a place where um, the, there you, you can write a study a decade ago, and it still seems appropriate today, unfortunately, because the standard hasn't really changed. But there was a study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine over a decade ago uh, from Japan showing arinotecan uh, plus cisplatin versus etoposide plus cisplatin. The arinotecan was clearly superior, both in progression-free survival um, and even more so in overall survival, when an attempt was made to replicate those results in the, uh, you know, in the United States, what you can see here is that there was no difference in time to disease progression. And for any of you who are hoping that maybe you can see some difference between those two curves, when you look at the overall survival, um, there I think it's even harder to see any true difference between, uh, between the two. So um, in conclusion, I, I think that the data is still unclear that there is uh, clearly benefit in EGFR mutant patients uh, to getting an EGFR inhibitor. The survival data um, appears a fat and it may be a little bit of an outlier in the two data sets, both in terms of the degree of benefit that is seen in the, e in the exon 19 deletion and the lack of benefit seen um, comparatively in the LA58R mutation. When you put them together, it looks similar. And I'm, my concern would be that it's parsing a data set too closely. And the fortunate thing is that we'll know the answer because uh, Luxlung 7, as Jack mentioned.